So good morning. My name is Ben from Arsene. I'm CEO of the Silverstone Technology Cluster. Welcome to the first event of our Wearable Technology Special Interest Group. Now, our special interest groups are created by our members and they aim to bring together businesses that operate in similar technological spaces. They serve to unite like-minded individuals to talk about pertinent issues, new technologies, future trends, funding opportunities, collaborative projects, and the like. Each group has a number of champions to help shape the theme and the contents of the events, which the SEC then organizes. The champions for this group are Colin Jackson from Partner Electronics, Phil Brady from PNB Mobile, Nick Fox Mill from Advancing Innovations, and Steve Borley from Decathlon. With today's event, we want to give you a feel for what is out there today and also glimpse into the future a little as we start the journey for this special interest group. We will organize further events into, uh, in 2021 to allow you to keep up to date with what is happening in our cluster in this exciting technical space. Now, as per usual, please post any questions in the chat or raise your hand to ask a question in person after each presentation. So we'll start today um, with Tristan Allen from Room 44. Um, so Tristan, over to you. And um, this is where we're going to do the Chris Whitty thing because um, I'll be sharing my screen. And then um, Tristan can tell me when to move. Um, so hopefully this is all going to work. Am I going to refer to you as PVB all the way through it? Just so. Ah, you, you could just say next slide, please, or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, really. So um, I don't know what view everybody's seeing. I've, I've got the other uh, presenter view. Yeah, does everybody see the, the slides as they should be now? Because hopefully that's the case, right? Yep. yep. Right. Okay, <laughs> cool. Thank you very much indeed. Next slide, please. Um, Pim's asked me to come and talk today about um, how, how we as an innovation agency, transpose ideas from one sector to another. So I'm going to run you through a case study um, and, 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 and an example of what, what my business does. So as you can see it on the screen, just to introduce ourselves. As, as a consultancy, we use design thinking to look at problems that customers don't know they have yet in, in lots of cases to identify opportunities uh, in, in the market from the consumer perspective. Thanks, Pim. <clears throat> Just a, just a little um, list of bullet points. I mean, you, you'd probably be aware of all of these yourself anyway, but I just want to set the context for how things have changed over the last very, very short space of time. Um, the over 65s um, are a large demographic in the market, depending on which sector you're in, obviously, but broadly speaking, they've become a very important demographic. And again, un an unrelated fact, but 60% of people use corrective eye products, vision products, you know, not something you typically think about. When you look around the room or look around the screen there uh, to see who's wearing glasses, there'll be quite a few people. And when we talk about digital technology being invisible a little bit later on, glasses is one place where, they, where, where this tech is going to get built into. Um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but looking, looking just, just, just skipping through things that we didn't know a couple of years ago, couple of three years ago, gesture control, for example, is becoming more and more to the fore. There's a, there's a very strong sense that um, whilst, whilst the over 65s are very important to us, Gen Z is very important to us as marketers as well. And of course, there's this contentious uh, point that I always pick out, which is to say that mobile phones are going to slide out of importance over the next two or three years. This, this, this hook we have into, into screen-based technology is being eaten away by um, audio and voice control. And I think we're gonna see that much, much more strongly as AI gets more competent and recognizes voice. <clears throat> you may argue with the fact that SpaceX gets to Mars in a couple of years, you know, let's go ask that nice Mr. Musk about that. But the, you know, there are just a few bullet points to, 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 to give you a sense of the speed at which things are evolving around us. Thanks, Pim. Now, the, the, the way that we approach innovation is to, as I said at the start, identify um, unmet needs, but not to view a, a client um, innovation issue as one that's specific to them. We, of course it is, but it doesn't sit within a bubble. So understanding what products do now and the value that they, do, and the value that they will deliver in the future to match that up with with what the market values now and in the future. Now, they aren't always the same thing. And I'll talk about that specifically in a second. Thanks, Pim. 
So just on to sensors, um, I'm gonna to talk to you about the way that we came at a problem that was present from an opportunity that was presented to us and, and where it's led us. Thanks, Pim. Sensors, um, I mean, they're, 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 they're omnipresent in everything we do at the moment um, and, and they're gonna get more, more and more so. Um, you know, they provide data, they provide the understanding of, his, of in this case, of wound condition. And just to give you a bit of a, a heads up, in two or three slides time, there are some pretty unpleasant photographs. So if you're a bit squeamish, please look away. Um, but patients struggle to identify their, to identify with the questions that healthcare providers ask them. Sometimes those two cohorts speak very different languages and it's not uncommon for there to be a misunderstanding using the same language. So sensor technology is, is it, is evolving and of course they, they're becoming more accurate more sensitive and and smaller in size and cost so we we're able to look at the opportunities for sensors in wound care and 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 offer some op some opportunities going forward and in this particular case we're looking at um the ph of a of a wound the temperature of a wound primarily actually the saturation how how quickly exudate is emitted and and well that's where the condom the conductivity comes in actually and then also the the biomarkers that, that that we're able to identify from the volatiles coming off a wound thanks pim so this this idea started life with a, um, a dean of a faculty at a university um, involved in bioscience and he like lots of deans have spin-off businesses um where they so i they see um promising um, graduates and pull them into an idea and invest and sort of stay close to an idea if it's got potential. And this particular Dean thought that it'd be a great idea to build a master batch into a plastic, which would change color when, when milk went off. <clears throat> now, fr from a white coat perspective, that's a great idea. From a sensible commercial perspective, it's not so great because milk bottles have living films, thermal seals, and also the first thing that anybody did with milk back at that time was to sniff it before they used it. It's a little bit like the, the Americans making a great pen to go, to, the, to go into space when the Russians used a pencil. Now we, we talked about it, we ideated around it, we discussed it and we went to lidding films as, as, as an idea. Maybe that was somewhere we'd be, where we could take it. But through the course of conversation, when you'd start discussing protein types and thinking about beef and chicken and fish, you, you eventually come around to the idea that actually the human body, when it gets into a state of degradation, is also a protein that's degrading in a similar fashion. So we, we just switched our, our, our attention to a different opportunity. Thanks, Pim. And we built out this, this idea, which is, very, which is presented in very simple abstract here, where we could start building sensors into wound dressings. And this, this was a project that started back in 2000 and I think it was 2012. Um, we, we built this abstract up and took it to the TSB at the time, Technology, Technology Strategy Board, and got a funding, a co-match funding, built a, built a consortium of um, two universities and three industrial partners to prove the concept that we could affect the standardized treatment pathway by introducing um, sensors to the to the diagnostics um, anybody that's worked in in well, probably most of you haven't worked in wound sensing or in uh, perhaps in medicine but to give you a picture again a wound can be a leg it can be a a, um, a cheek of a backside yeah people with diabetes for example have chronic conditions which, which just don't heal very quickly. And the way to investigate the condition of that wound is to, is to have a look. And what practice nurses also do is smell what's under the dressing, which doesn't sound very nice, but it's what they do because they've been trained in and experienced in this field. And what we wanted to do was to try and build, a, build out a situation where patients can sit at home and convey that data to, to a to a um, healthcare provider without them, A, having to come into hospital, B, having to take hospital bed and C, disturb the, the dressing on the wound surface in case it disrupted improving cells. So the sensors we built in were um, printed conductivity, uh, sorry, a, a, a printed volatile sensor, 
And this technology we took from uh, the same startup actually, who was using printed sensors to test the condition of swimming pool water. But you know, it's a printed sensor. Once you know the volatile that you're looking for, you can, you can test for it, a bit like drug testing in sport. The pH sensor, we're not gonna talk about that too much because there's more interesting ones. The, the moisture sensors to, to, to measure the rate of exudate emission because people who are working in the wound in the wound healing field at the coal face face a problem and they're typically trying to make a wound that's too dry wetter and a wound that's too wet drier so they need to know this rate of emission and then this very important thermistor and that little picture on the right hand side of that thumbnail is actually a picture of, a, of an array that we developed which would sit in a, um, a bandage now the next picture is not so great so I'll just warn you thanks Pim. This is a picture of a wound as it progresses over a period of time. <clears throat> and the left-hand side is before and the right-hand side is after. And what we wanted to do was to thermal map this image. We just go to the next one, please, Pim. Um, and try and identify whether or not a thermal map would be useful in the area of wound healing. This is before this had really been in, in investigated that much actually in medicine. Um, probably getting on for yeah, well, I mean, we're getting on for seven, eight years ago now. We also wanted to find out if we could identify, and it's a little bit hard to see here, but identify hot spots within the wound bed, which would identify where infection was occurring within the overall scheme of, uh, of that wound. And that was possible too. The sensors that we found uh, to use were so sensitive actually, that when they were on a patient in a hospital, they were even tracking changes in the environment when the door was open and closed to the ward. So we, 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 we were able to pinpoint through, through research that we could, we could identify very, very clearly or precisely where some localized infection was occurring. And then that patient could get called in and treated accordingly. On the flip side, we also wanted to be able to use this, this, this device to identify when wounds were in a, in a, in a condition where they could receive stem cell or other biological treatments. So again, not disturbing the, the wound surface was a really important opportunity for some, uh, for some doctors or that doctors thought we could develop for them. Thank you, Pim. Now, this is a quote from a guy that I met in the States several years ago um, as an academic uh, involved in nutrition basically, but he started to talk to me about, sorry, sorry for the step change, but you'll see where this is going in a second, um, about how packaged, wouldn't it be great if packaged foods could talk to me as I walk down the supermarket aisle and help me decide whether they, they're good for me or not? How, how cool would it be if I could do that on my phone? And that's, that's, a, that's a quote from 2015. So five years on, here we are, and, and that, that, that vision has been realized. I'm gonna talk about it now. The, the, the connection between wound health and nutrition isn't the same for everybody, obviously, but, the, but the, there is a, um, a theory that, we're, that we're, we're very interested in that says if you have your, your DNA profile mapped early on in life, your health predispos predispositions can also be um, made available to you. And the way that you provide nutrition to your body can, in some cases, mitigate some of those health risks manifesting themselves later on, if you know early enough. For example, people in their, fifth, gentlemen in their 50s and 60s get quite interested in green tea because you know, prostate becomes an issue. Well, you probably have to have been drinking green tea for all of your life for that issue not to become an issue later on in some cases. So if it's a particular problem in your family line, then it's, it's good to know about it early. And these two concepts of wound health and nutrition are one that we brought together and we're still working on actually, but it's, this is where this is going to go now. So the idea of transposing one discipline, we've gone from taking an idea that was started out as, as a food packaging idea, we've taken it to wound, uh, to advanced wound healing, and now we're taking it back into food. But there's obviously a, a connection between those, those, those two areas. Thanks, Pim. <clears throat> um, Contextually, how am I doing for time? Am I okay? I think I am. Um, contextually, obviously, since we since this project started, everything around us has changed. And generations, Gen Z, as I hate saying, but kind of have to say it because that's how it sounds best, is starting to drive 
changes in the way that we behave and the way that we behave around food and other parts of and, and other decision making that goes on. It's not surprising that to hear, of course, that the later generations are native to digital technology. Of course they are, more so than I am, for example. It's, a mo it's, it's, it's the most diverse age group we've ever seen. There are more languages being spoken in one household than we've ever seen before, for example. It's a, it's a really interesting, exciting time. Um, and it's also the first time when you have five generations working in the same workplace, which I find, again, very exciting because the cross fertilization between those generations and those experience levels should benefit business. And, and there's also thought to be somebody that will live to be 150. And of course, once you've got to that point, other things are possible too, which is a different conversation. Next slide, please. So just, just to give one very, very simple example, this is, this is a, a diabetic screening tool. And it, again, it touches on the two areas that I've been talking about. So sorry, it's been a bit of a, a scattergun, but I'm gonna pull this together now. A person with diabetes spends many, many hours in a year managing their own condition. And that number was, uh, was provided by, by this particular organization. But in terms of time with a provider, they get very little time with a doctor. And we wanted to try and see if we could increase that, in, that, that time, that interface. Um, if you just flip four pin. <clears throat> For example, if you go onto Pinterest and, and look up wound care, you'll see all kinds of horrific images and all kinds of things that people have given tags to that sit in this area. So now people are starting to self-diagnose in a way that wasn't possible until this, these platforms were available to us. And I'm gonna go out on a limb now and say that what medics don't like the sound of is that people do this for themselves, first of all, take an interest in their own health and not trust the doctor, but also that, that the the technology that sits behind diagnostics, so Watson is a great uh, is a great example because it's been there for a long time collecting symptomatic data. The, these, these systems have been collecting data for so long now that if you are able to present your symptoms to a computer, there's a much better chance of you getting an accurate diagnostic than if you uh, diagnosis than if you were to present to a GP. Now that sounds a little bit like it shouldn't be the case, but it certainly is. And if you are like me, when I go to a doctor, the first thing my doctor does seems to be to Google. I'm sure he's not looking at Google. Maybe he's looking at WebMD or something instead. Uh, next slide, please, Pim. And then if you go into the app store, you can also pick up apps where you can do all kinds of things on your phone to help manage your own condition as well. Again, out on a limb, I personally think that patients are already starting to self self-treat and self-prescribe in response to these two sources of data that you've just seen. I think that the dark web is quite useful to people who are prepared to take a risk to treat themselves with, with prescription drugs that they can't get easily or may, may have trouble getting through the traditional routes. And this, this, this route to treatment, I think, is one that has to be watched quite carefully and shouldn't be ignored as an opportunity for the people that are interested to try and manage it. But now that patients have apps available to them and are used to using them, and we've just seen Gen Z is very digital native, they, they, they won't stop now. The opportunities for them to get involved in their own healthcare is, are, are becoming more and more manifold. Pim, next slide, please. <clears throat> you can see in the, in, in, in the case of wearables, I've already said that um, tech is becoming invisible. This isn't particularly invisible, but if you want to test your blood sugar ongoing, you know, this device, you'll have seen it in the summer, particularly when people were wearing short sleeves, this little plastic disc that sits on the back of their, back of their upper arm, it's testing um, blood glucose all, all the time. You know, anybody can buy this if they choose to and stick it onto an app and just do it themselves. You haven't got to go to a doctor to get this anymore. There are, there are, there are ways of doing it. Pim, next slide, please, Pim. And this is a particularly interesting product that I want to talk about in the context of wearables again, because <clears throat> um, the guy who started this business, a guy called Chris Tumazu, also used to own one of the trading, uh, the industrial partners in our consortium, which was called Tumaz, who developed the, pr the proof of concept for that wound dressing. So now I'm, I'm drawing together the, the idea that you know, somebody else had this idea too. He, he and I haven't collaborated at all on this, so he, this is a completely separate 
separate thing. But you can go into Covent Garden now or, or into some larger John Lewis stores and go and visit the DNA nudge um, table, give them a DNA sample. They will give you back your DNA profile as far as nutrition is concerned uh, and, and, and offer you some idea in the same way that 23andMe and, and um, uh, DNA Fit does um, to give you some idea of what your predispositions may be. And then they, they'll turn this into um, some data they download to, to an app on your phone and you can buy a little device, a little lozenge that you, that you can wear in a bracelet and do exactly what Frederick Abram said in, in the earlier slide, which is on the next slide pin. And go into supermarkets wearing your, your, your DNA nudge wristband and the little slot down the side of the bracelet at the head there is actually an infrared barcode reader. So you can scan packaged groceries on the shelf in Morrison's or Waitrose, whichever is your preference. <clears throat> and as long as it's in their database, that bracelet will give you a red, amber or green light on the front of the display, telling you whether that thing matches your nutritional requirement at that time. And you can, you can also build into the app your, your preference. So if you, if you have a preference to be a marathon runner on that day, or if you're training for a marathon versus some other endeavor, which may be more cerebral and less energetic, you can tweak and tailor the, the readings that this thing will give you. And I think in, in terms of where that original proof of concept took us and has taken the industry, you're now seeing this, this healthcare um, tool presented as a consumer product. And although we're, we're in quite early, a quite earlier stage of development, this kind of facility is going to become more and more available to us in lots of different medical and nutritional fields. Pim, I think I've got just a few more slides. Babylon Health obviously is, is out there providing healthcare differently and there are lots of different examples of this. Thrive is one. Uh, we could talk for a long time about the different models that are there, but reaching healthcare through, through non-traditional um, ways is not uncommon now. And again, to, just to overlay those tools I've just shown you, you know, talking to a doctor on Babylon when you've already got your profile and your nutritional requirements lined up and you know what's happening to you as a result of eating in a certain way, these things are very useful to that, to that PCP patient conversation. Uh, next slide, Pim. Um, the Internet of Apps, you know, you've heard about the Internet of Things, the, 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 internet, the internet of Everything. The app store is only, what is it, nine years old now? It's been there since 2011, I think, the first one. So the way that apps have taken over our life is, is really interesting. How that's going to um, evolve into a less screen-driven technology is going to be interesting too. If you're aware of um, Project Jackar, which I've spoken about in previous presentations, um, this, this collaboration between Levi's and Google, where they've come up with, with, a, with a cloth that you can gesture control your phone, for example, that, that also tells us that apps are going to become invisible in the not too distant future. Next one up, uh, please, Pim. And then getting towards the end now, <clears throat> of course, voice activation and um, audio tech is, is also listening to everything we do. And because we're being monitored 24 seven by almost everything we, we have around, the devices we have around us, be it a watch or a phone or a, or a, or a box on the sideboard, um, if sideboards are a thing, sorry. Um, you know, you, you can imagine all this data is being captured. And I think the, the next revolution is, is going to be when patients start, well, when, when patients start to understand the value of what they're giving away for free at the moment. Right, Pim, last, I think it's the last one now. Uh, one more, sorry. One more example, sorry. Um, you guys may know this and you may not. I, I came into contact with Proteus um, five or six years ago. We're not super first to the deal and, and spent a billion dollars to, to secure this, this device. But what, what this is, is, is an ingestible sensor, um, which, you, which, which is given to patients on certain uh, conditions. In this early case, it was for CNS patients who were looking at, you know, had, had problems with psychosis, et cetera. One of, the, one of the worst things that happens to somebody in that state is that when they feel better, they stop taking the drugs and then suddenly they don't feel better anymore and they don't understand why. So what, 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 what Proteus was doing at his most basic level was to tell PC, HCPs that the patient was complying with, a, with their regimen. And that's, that's a very, very useful and cost-saving thing to do in the healthcare space as well. So 
I'll just spin on now. I think I'm getting towards the end. I've already said this, Pim, thank you. All right. That's no, all right. So that's the end. Um, I, there is just one more slide telling you who I am and where to find me. If you're interested to have a chat afterwards, I'm sure this is going to sound like a scattergun presentation, but I was trying to cram a lot of stuff into a short space of time. Um, I'm sure there are people coming on all, after me who will talk much more logically and sensibly about the thing, uh, wearable devices in medical as well. But I wanted to give you an idea that when we're talking to customers about innovation strategy, we very often get into this um, cycle of people trying to sweat out the value of, the, of their own people in the room. And there's massive value in looking left and right of where any, any one company might be operating. So not to ignore <clears throat> medical disciplines when you're in food manufacture, I think is quite an important um, um, example to illustrate. And that's what I tried to do here. So thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Tristan. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we now move on to the, the Q&A session while I'll try to sort out my computer. Um, I'll kick off, if I, if I may, because I thought it was, I mean, obviously, the link between sort of the medical and food stuff is, is really, really interesting. But from a, um, from a medical point of view, because um, obviously, you, you indicated that there's lots of apps and there's lots of different technology coming in and all that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, is, is that sort of stuff regulated and should it be? How, how does that work? Are there concerns about that area or? But it's regulated as far as, I mean, yes, it is. Um, I, and I would not claim to be the expert on this, but any device coming to market will, will, will have gone through some screening and approval process, absolutely. And I think the apps measurements, I mean, I'm sure there are apps out there that don't comply in some way and would give somebody a false, a, a false reading. But again, the behaviors that people have in the past demonstrated are that we go and ask somebody what their opinion is and we trust what they say and continuously mon being monitored and monitoring ourselves is a is a facility that wasn't available to us until quite recently and actually even though it is available to us we still don't do it very much you know when 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 the fitbit came out it was the biggest thing in in um, health insurance it went corporate really really quickly every you know lots of companies like insurance businesses were given all their employees fitbits and six months later they're sitting in the desk drawer being ignored because the individual doesn't know what the benefit is after they've done their 10,000 steps a day. And, or they've been told they aren't, they're not doing 10,000 steps. And in the case of vitality insurance, you start getting penalized financially for not keeping up the payments on, uh, sorry, not keeping up your steps and your cost of your, your Apple watch goes up a, a, a bit. So the, there's a, there's a difference in motivation. I think the later generations to mine are more inclined to allow their devices to do the monitoring with them and for them and to read the data, understand the output and respond accordingly. And that's, that's, that's a market and behavioral change that we're going to see over the next few years really, really strongly. But presumably that also allows, um, you know, the um, alternative medicine to come in and, and, and all that sort of stuff. It's just like if it's, if it's not almost like a, a regulated space, people could come up with all sorts of different things on to do all sorts of different different stuff. So it, it could become quite a messy marketplace. But it. Well, you get, I mean, supplementation is actually a really interesting area. I, I, I run a, um, a small supplements business for a, um, a, a professor of neuroendocrinology who's based in, in North London. And I don't run it for him. He's, he, I run it for some backers who, who he, he produces the formulations for. Now, he, he's a bit of a wacko um, when it comes to the medical um, fraternity because he's not just trading in medicine. He's unusual in that he listens to his nutritionists and his dietitians and approaches the patient together. Whereas typically a, a professor of medicine will offer a prescription and then the patient will get pushed off to a nutritionist to, look up, to, to come up with some complementary um, nutrition as well. This is where I think patients and well, that until they become a patient, consumers are consumers, you know, they go shopping, they, they do the best for themselves. I think there's a, there's a bit of a breakdown in trust when, when white coats think these people can't think for themselves to some extent and think, and, and, and there's some arrogance and hubris as well. I think these, these, these barriers that have been constructed over the years are breaking down and people are taking more control. And although you can buy anything you want on Amazon probably or Alibaba, 
sensibly, if you're looking to improve a condition, which you can't do with supplementation legally, but to maintain a condition, you'll go looking for data to support that decision. Fascinating. Does anybody else have any other questions or, or comments? Colin? Um, yeah, just um, on the, the medical front, especially with the, um, the ability of a lot of these new sensors to enable self-diagnosis, what's the general reaction from the medical industry on that? Are they embracing the technology or is there um, any reluctance there? I'm not really sure I can call it, I'm qualified to answer the question. You might have to ask a doctor. I think there's the way that medicine is taught, from my experience, I haven't been taught it, but I've listened to people that have been, they, they, they're taught to have authority in their, in their specialism. And I, I would think, and the better doctors obviously keep up to date with the training and new data and they, you know, doctors read really quickly <laughs> and, and they also write very quickly. Um, but they, they, I think, I think there's, there's, a, there's a dawning realization that technology uh, artificial insurance, uh, some machine learning is able to do as good a job as, or a better job than a single doctor when, when presented with a patient at the first cut. So I, I, I think there's some skepticism, um, but I would imagine that as Generation Z comes into the market as those doctors, that skepticism will break down. And the response to the, 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 new, the new tech will be the same on that side of the fence as it, as it is on the patient side of the fence. Excellent. I can add that just, just to that, Justin, as well, just to give me my insight, because my family are medical in Australia and in the UK. So I have doctors here and there. Um, and on my mother's side, telemedicine has been widely adopted in Australia because there's huge logistical challenges to getting patient data and people coming in. So it's more embraced as it's supplementary to their resource and their knowledge rather than, say, replacing it, where in the UK there's more hesitance to adopt it because we have very good coverage from a GP perspective. So people are very much being pushed in that direction. So I think logistical, the nature of the market as well has to be absorbed into that. I think that the, the way that medicine is delivered as well is, is also changing. It's becoming more mobile. And I think that at the moment, structurally we're looking through, and we're looking at localism is becoming a thing more than it was in the past. COVID has taught us to stay close to home and this 15 minute village idea overlays all of this. People, people, people aren't gonna to wanna to go so far and travel to work and even go for medicine as far as they used to have to. And, if, and, and you can see that there, there are sparks of trends coming out of large territories like in America and Australia, where you know, the Australia's always had a flying doctor. Well, mobile services are starting to tour the country and the States in trailers giving dentistry where, where, where it hasn't been available in quite the same way as we would experience it in the past. And I think there are all kinds of things going on all the time in innovation and service delivery. And the, 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 the clash of these new ideas and, in, and technology as it develops is gonna be really, really revolutionary in the way healthcare is received. Excellent. Um, I'm actually wondering, because um, Duncan, you, um, Duncan Banks, you, you made a comment that um, you, you train various people and there is a problem with attack. Is, would you like to come in and, and comment on that and, and maybe say something? Yeah, the, the main problem with the use of new technology is the vast amount of data that a GP would have to be presented with in a 10 minute consultation. And the advice that GPs are given the Royal College of GPs is to just acknowledge that the data exists and to try and give some support to that person to keep monitoring. And if if, uh, if it's a device that's approved, for example, a home pressure monitoring device, then to trust that data, but otherwise just to try to placate the individual because it just ends up extending the, the consultation time. So, so I think that's exactly why patients are looking to spend more time researching their own conditions because their face-to-face -face time with the PCP is very, very limited. And yeah, there's no, there's no doubt that the data you've just described is available if someone's in, inclined to read it and analyze it. And that could be the individual. I agree, but I also made a comment about the fact that because of COVID, a lot of people that should be going to the doctor are not. And actually this during this time, what we should have been doing is to upscale our poss the possibility of monitoring people at home having home consultations on a regular basis to avoid them having to go to the GP practice 
those people on, on long-term conditions are not being seen to. For example, type 2 diabetes, uh, the, the Desmond program, has only just been rolled out online, and that is eight months. Yeah, I, no, I, I was a, an SBRI technical um, reviewer for, uh, for years, and um, some of the concepts that were applied for, that, that applied for funding just didn't meet the, the agenda need at that particular time. And, and lots of those ideas would have been great now, but, but because they were bounced at the time of funding was offered, they'll probably be two or three years behind the curve. And that, that's, that's the time lag that we're looking at, I think. Interesting, interesting. And um, I'd just like to point out in the chat that Theresa made um, the comment that um, obviously Medilink are, are very active in this area and have a lot of um, webinars that, um, that support that sort of thing. Um, I mean, obviously, SDC have close links with, with Medilink. So um, if you'd like to know more, either contact Theresa directly, um, as she's uh, given her, her details there, or, or you know, contact us and, and we can put you in touch and, and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's clearly a very fascinating area with, with a lot of potential, um, and, and I would say a lot more to come. So, um, yeah, it, it should be interesting to, uh, to see what happens. Um, I think in the interest of time, thank you very much, Chris, and I, I think that was very interesting. There was a lot there that I didn't know about. Um, and actually, personally, the, the DNA shopping thing, I'm, I'm quite excited about. So I might, I might go and check that out. I quite like that sort of thing. Um, but we'll now move on to, um, to the next presenter. Um, the next presenter is uh, Simon from um, the OU. So Simon, if I can hand over to you for your presentation. Okie dokie, thank you very much. Let's just get the screen share happening. Right, I want to share sound. Okay. Can you see that okay? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, great. So, um, so as Pim said, I'm Simon Holland from the Open University, and I'm going to be talking about wearable haptic technology for rehabilitation after stroke. I should just say quickly that I have comprehensively balls this up in this respect, um, which is to say I'm used to giving research talks, and I think I assumed I'd be talking to business business people rather than a bunch of really smart engineers. So I've probably stripped out exactly the wrong slides but um hopefully when we get to the question time if anybody's remotely interested we might be able to tease those bits out so without more ado okay so background um overview of the talk in a nutshell so stroke is this gigantic cause of uh, loss of mobility for people in the uk and throughout the world so at the Open University, we've developed a wearable haptic device, the, the haptic bracelets uh, for gait rehabilitation after stroke. And we have demonstrated their effectiveness in published research. And the aim of the talk here is we're seeking expressions of interest from potential collaborative partners. Uh, okay. So more particularly, so every year um, in the UK, you get 100,000 new cases of stroke. You've already got a million people in the UK living with past strokes. Um, so stroke, you typically get one side of the body muscle weakness, and this generally impairs mobility, reduces independence. So many survivors never regain a level of walking adequate for common daily activities. And walking badly often leads to things like joint pain, loss of bone mineral density, increased risk of, risk of falls, more damage if you do fall. And this imposes huge costs on health and social services. Um, conventional rehabilitation is really labor and time intensive, both, both for the stroke survivor and health services. And consequently, it's heavily rationed. You basically just don't get it for anything after just a couple of weeks or something after your stroke. But for stroke survivors, improving walking, mobility and independence is almost always the major goal. In fact, the major goal is getting your speech back if your speech is impaired. But, but apart from that, it's getting your mobility back in. So quick, um, quick video um this is a while back but it just gives you some kind of idea this is a few years back but now problem is getting this to okay just give me a second that should make it go stroke is one of the biggest causes of disability after a stroke many survivors are left with weakness on one side of the body causing asymmetric gait. This can lead to joint pain, 
loss of bone mineral density and a twofold increase in the risk of hip fracture. Existing therapies are expensive and rarely suitable outside the clinic. Walking in time to an ordinary metronome can improve walking in the lab, but outdoors, in busy streets, listening to an audio cue can block other sounds and be dangerous. Cueing by sense of touch is safer, unobtrusive, and more practical in everyday life. So, we made the haptic bracelets. Each contains a computer, motion sensors, Wi-Fi, and precise, powerful vibrotactiles. Worn on both ankles, they can cue metronomically by touch. The bracelets can also pace walking selectively and intelligently based on live gait data. In two pilot studies, we applied tactile metronomic cues to both ankles to evaluate the bracelets and gather views of health professionals and stroke survivors. The results were promising. Analysis of motion capture data demonstrated improved range of movement and better knee flexion. A new generation of smaller bracelets offer more convenience for everyday life. The bracelets work in three ways, by exploiting biological entrainment, directing attention and focusing proprioception, by providing inexpensive rehabilitation in everyday settings, the bracelets have the potential to improve independence and quality of life. <laughs> okay, so let's stop it there. Okay, so a great deal has changed since then. So, um, to avoid misleading you, so the device does not have to be bigger than a watch. Uh, we now realize you don't have to wear it on two ankles getting bipedal um, cues. Uh, we now know that you can get the bulk of the benefits wearing on a single wrist. We still need the inertial measurement unit because for the target users we're dealing with, um, you have to be very careful about the user interface and you have to get cues from what they do rather than having them fiddle around with a tiny user interface. Um, and also we now know, we, we, we now have the data that it's not just promising about it, but that it's effective. So um, it may sound kind of extremely Mickey Mouse in the sense that you've got a metronome that makes people walk better. What's going on there? Okay, so just a little bit about theory. It's nothing to do with stimulus response. It's not people responding to cues. It's about the human capacity for entrainment. And the relevant theory is the very little known but proven uh, neural resonance theory. Um, okay, so very briefly, humans, and this is particularly humans, are periodicity seekers. We are involuntarily paying attention to periodic phenomena in the environment, visual, auditory, haptic, we often imitate periodic phenomena vocally or through bodily motion in real time and from memory. These capacities are absent in other species with some limited extensions and humans appear to have dedicated banks of neurons specifically for periodicity detection. Just very briefly, um, okay for a long time um, it was really thought that this business entrainment, these neurons in the brain were limited to humans, but literally what happened a small number of years ago was somebody literally pointed this out on YouTube. Okay, so, um, and it's now um, thought there's the vocal learning hypothesis that rhythmic entrainment may be a byproduct of vocal learning mechanisms, um, but it's absolutely not present in non-human primates. Very briefly, monkeys cannot um, entrain in this way. They can tell when, a, when rhythms start and stop, but what they cannot do is synchronize themselves to an external rhythm, um, at least in all the experiments done to date, whereas neonates can do that, um, which is sort of interesting. 
Okay, so backstroke rehab. This is going to be quite a brief talk with all technical bits stripped out, but never mind. So, um, okay, so in particular, if you've had a stroke, you're walking slower. You've got asymmetric step times and step lengths. You got a all all kinds of stuff is is bad. But um, temporal asymmetry is very common, very resistant to rehabilitation. So. Since that video was made, we've done three kinds of empirical studies. We've done lab studies um, where people have their walking measured um, at a baseline. Then we just give them um, we just give them ten minutes um, of walking up and down using the device, and then we measure what happens afterwards. So in the lab, we're just measuring immediate effects. Um, over minutes, um, and then we measure what, what happens after they've been cued in this way. Second kind of study, um, in the wild, we gave people a prototype device to take home for two weeks, and we looked at their pre and post. Um, and then in a longitudinal, um, after letting someone have one in the wild for two weeks, we then tested them a year later after no other intervention. So. Um, in the lab studies, um, over half um, showed immediate, though not necessarily lasting improvement. Um, comments from the physiotherapist were such like, she became more confident, she started using a light, lighter walking stick. This was in follow-up after the lab trial. It's so nice to see her not thinking too much about her paretic leg, just let it go, let it flow. Um, okay, so I don't know whether, right, we, we have a video here of the, in the wild. So what we've got is the walking pre and post, those streamed over the net with buffering and such like. I'm not sure whether you'll see the difference, but let's give it a try. Oops, got to start. Ah, damn it. Okay, I've got to get the video to start. There we go. So this is just somebody walking before any intervention. So have a look at um, how they're walking. And then this is two weeks later after taking it home for two weeks. You may not be able to see any difference, though um, the physios were quite enthusiastic. Um, increased velocity of gait, increased number of steps, uh, time spent in left and right stance, more equal, better step length equality, et cetera, et cetera. Goodness me, I have made this talk short. OK, so. Um, Basically, we're seeking expressions of interest from potential collaborative partners. But if anybody's still there, um, please ask me some questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Very, very, very interesting. Um, I think the, the, the desire of you to, to obviously work with people to make this happen is very interesting. And I think we'll touch um, on that in a moment. Um, I mean, presumably it wasn't possible technology-wise to just um, plug something into an existing like Fitbit or smartwatch or any of that sort of stuff. Is okay, that right? great question. So almost the first thing we did was we made an app for the Apple Watch. Okay, but you really have to understand the target users here. Um, even with the haptics cranked up to the maximum, um, most of them could not feel it. That's the first thing. And second thing was there was no way they could control it because don't forget half your body screwed up. So in fact, you, you put the device on your crap wrist so you can manipulate it with your good wrist, but then it's harder to feel. And um, in fact, in a way, the technology is fairly simple, though there's a lot of refinements because for a small device you've got to get power supply and recharging right if you want to interface with clinicians you know you've got to get the the infrastructure for the you know for the backing up the data um, to make the uh, to make the interface work you need to use an inertial measurement unit and have quite a lot of stuff happening automatically so okay um, Apple watch definitely didn't work in fact so the device we're using now has a great hefty haptic, although it's very precise. 
Excellent, in interesting. So um, Les Gill asked, what, what collaboration is you looking for? And also um, Alan has a, has a question on that. So maybe if we refer to Alan first and then um, maybe you can comment on Les Gill's as well. So Alan, what's your, what's your question? I'll I'm just um, I'm interested in, in knowing what what the challenges are on getting this onto onto a lot of people because it, it looks to me like a very elegant, very smart, scalable way of approaching this. Um, and that, to me, that's often the thing that's lacking with with new technology is it's very complex, it's expensive. This looks really scalable. So how? Why is it not? What are the next steps? What are the the, the okay. barriers? Okay, so what are the next steps? What are the barriers? Okay, so I mean, the real thing, to be absolutely honest with you, is that I am not particularly business minded, but fortunately, I have picked up colleagues who um, have done stuff like spin outs. And so just that difference alone has moved it from just being something I've been doing research on into something that could be um, moved out. So, um, we have looked at a number of things. I mean, um, we, okay, what's preventing it? Really nothing is preventing it. I mean, what we need is a UK partner who's used to, for example, applying to Innovate UK, so getting most of the money back. Um, that's just about all we need. Um, just a willing partner who knows the way around getting there. I mean, obviously what we really want is somebody who's good at um, design and prototyping because the really key thing here is that the idea is very simple and easy to communicate. But we've been doing studies on this for five years now and we know that it's getting the user interaction right that is, the, that is absolutely essential. If you screw that up, people just can't use it or can't use it independently at home. Okay, and, and I assume awareness within the industry or within within the, the clinical environment would also be a bit of a hurdle, or is that? Well, that's an interesting thing because we 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 have worked. Um, we've worked with the residential neurological care home. We've worked with NHS physiotherapists. Um, we've worked with research physiotherapists, um, and there's a hurdle to get over because we're using a completely different mechanism from what they're used to because they're, they're used to musculoskeletal going for the muscle and they initially tend to think it's something about stimulating the muscle. It's nothing to do with that. It's to do with this neurological mechanism. What's happening is that um, as you walk to the beat, it's kind of, it's like doing the volition bit for you. So, so amazingly, we found it works not just for stroke, though that's the biggest market, if you like, biggest bunch of sufferers. It actually works for people with Parkinson's, amazingly Huntingdon's, really evil disease, and, and um, cerebral palsy, um, because it's offloading a load of effort and coordination from your brain to something external. But of course, you have to walk at different paces in different context so you need um, an IMU and possibly a bit of machine learning to really make things go smoothly but I mean the technology is really really straightforward and um, the results we've only just moved into publishing but we, we we now have gotten published and so there's really not a lot of barrier to this going forward I don't think. Good to hear very good to hear. I think you, yeah, it's, uh, the, the, there must be huge applications for this sort of thing. It's good to see. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'd, I'd like to refer to Colin and then we'll go to you, lads, if that's, that's okay. okay um, yeah, just a couple of quick questions. Um, one from a sort of a process point of view, the, the learning and um, training, shall we say. Is this something you envisage being done as part of the initial rehabilitation? Or is this something that they could do at home with a bit of help? And what? from a more technical point of view, um, you say you need some more powerful haptics than, say, the Apple Watch. What sort of power level are we looking at and how many hours a day would it need to run for? Ah, right. OK, it does not need to run for a bunch of hours. Right. I've forgotten the I've forgotten the power consumption of the device. Um, damn. Um, and it certainly it's an Apple Watch. Um, but we have OK, we've. But it, um, it does not have, right, okay, most of people in this position do not walk very much. And in fact, in, in our, in our two-week trial, 
we said try walking well try walking for as far as you can in the first day which could be two minutes it could be five minutes it could be 10 minutes and just try and walk a bit longer the next day so our very healthiest guy um who overdid it a bit was getting up to maybe 20 minutes something like that and you only need okay people with this condition are mostly indoors doing nothing and they mostly don't go out at all this encourages them to go out but it's typically just 20 minutes a day so so you know the um Oops, so um, although it requires a bit of beef to actually get it going, it doesn't have to go for a very long time. Um, let me see, so the first question, okay. There's a couple of ways of doing this. I mean, we are doing a lot of ongoing, we are bidding for other, um, we, we, we are bidding for further research with clinicians and that could lead to it being incorporated into what the NHS or private um, physiotherapists do. Um, but um, coming back to the point about medical certification, one route by which this, as far as I understand it, I'm not the expert, but from what people have, have told me, this could be marketed simply as a consumer device for end, unit, for end users, since it does have non-medical uses. Um, and it could be released in that way without medical certification, just used for self-managed use, though I'm not the expert. Duncan probably knows more about that than I do. Sorry, was that a reasonable answer? Excellent. Um, Les, I'd like to, to go to you for a moment and then we'll refer to, um, to Alex, although his question might have been answered. But, but Les, if he, are you, do you want to come in? Yeah, point? I'm here. All right. Yeah, the question about collaboration is a wide one and a broad one. And please come and talk to me afterwards if uh, so, we don't, so we can talk it in more detail. But um, Pim and I were on a, a, a program a couple of weeks back, which was the launch of the Midlands Centre for Data Driven Metrology, which is a long title, I know. And they've got some funding for measurement, Simon. Uh, I don't know whether you've come across it, but I can help you get into contact with them if you wish. Uh, they haven't started it really yet, although they've had a kind of a launch, but um, it could well be um, some funding that you could tap into. And uh, I'm working with a a company that's got haptic suits and haptic software that might be of use to you. So um, depending on what type of collaboration you want, come and give me a, give me a call and we can have a chat. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, for that. we can facilitate an introduction afterwards um, easily. And also everybody that's registered for the event um, will receive some in details as well. So if you wanted to follow up afterwards. <laughs> that wouldn't thank you. Awesome. Okay. I'd like to think there's quite a few people on this call who could potentially help. Or, yeah, or the thing collaborate. Un understanding the scope of collaboration you're looking for, because it's very wide. And I'm sure, as you rightly say, I'm sure there's a lot of people that have access or capabilities that could help Simon. And I'd also like to think that Teresa from Medlink could help with the um, with the medical certification and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, so I'm sure that, that, that we can do that. Um, Alex, if I may refer to you now, because you had a question as well and, and, and some comments. So. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think uh, Colin actually naturally asked the question that I was going to ask regarding battery life, because we, we come from a sort of productization uh, background there. But I, I think my comment really was obviously when you get to that stage after partners are selected if you need support from a, uh, making it a reality cost optimization size um, sort of battery life moving potentially from an ERM to an LRA or a piezo um, element it just just measuring kind of what punch you need to pack um, yeah from people like future we, we have that support available for free to you guys anyway so just let me know when you need to you're, help. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm very embarrassed that we were using an eccentric, an eccentric rotating mass there. I mean, but that's what we use there. But obviously, a piezo would be greatly superior. Or actually, solenoids have their benefits, but then I don't know anything about power consumption and so forth. I mean, you mentioned it possibly had um, use for people suffering from Parkinson's as well. Whereas, obviously, with a bit of luck, stroke recovery victims may get better presumably parkinson's sufferers will not it will get worse Absolutely. so they would want to use it for longer periods or okay um okay give me a second um okay so just to say that um do not think i'm saying that this works for everybody you know with any neurological condition nothing like that you know for for 
we found with people with a, a stroke who can answer a checklist so that we know they're in the zone, um, then about half of them it'll work with. Parkinson's is fantastically complicated. And as that progresses, things can get worse because touch can freeze you. But I mean, certainly, but in the, um, in the earlier stages, it appears to be useful. Um, Huntington's is a vile disease where you, you, um, you get it relatively young, you can walk less and less, you end up just in bed and then you die. But um, what the physios have told us from the very small pilot we've done with Huntington's is it may be that in particular people walk um, toe up and it just gets very difficult. And in the trial, the participant was walking far more toe down and the physiotherapist said, if that was a consistent effect, that could give them maybe two years more effective life before they had to retire to bed. But yeah, you absolutely have to distinguish between de uh, degenerative diseases and things like stroke where, where our brain re rewiring genuinely can improve things. Excellent. Very, very interesting. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments they would like to make? I, I saw Tristan's note on, on cross market fertilization potentially for this as well. Um, and, and certainly if anybody's interested in, in um, liaising with Simon. Uh, oh, Tristan, do you want to come in on that? Uh, I was just I was just thinking while Simon was talking um, a few years ago we worked with Reckitt Ben Kaiser who I know this is very off off the off the point as well but they they own a brand called Shoal which you may know have the inner soles in their in their shoes and I know so this is the consumer part of the market that there are lots of functional inner soles in shoes for various reasons and one of those was to prevent um, uh, geriatrics tripping because they just every time they they put their foot down it would send a, uh, a, a, a notification to their toes to lift their toes you know it's, it's it's not as complex as your idea but these things are out we we worked on a project where we would tie um shoe soles to gps and to evernote so that your wife could drop you in a, a note to pick up the laundry on the way home and your and your feet could take you to the laundrette you know so that, so that lots of consumer angles to the same tech if um to sort of if we could broaden the conversation a bit I know yeah. you've got a job to do, but, it, but it, there's a massive market out there to hit with similar tech if, if, it, if anybody was able, able to pick it up. You're absolutely right. Um, that's very interesting. Um, and in fact, we've got another project where we're working with um, uh, low cost generic motion sensors, um, you know, IMUs. And um, we're in that project, we're trying to do something for physiotherapists generally um just so people can do exercises at, at, at home and in in that application that would be in coordination with their clinician um so it's related but it's it's a very different thing you know with very different emphases but you're absolutely right there's a lot of stuff that um that can happen and probably will happen quite soon in this space to add to your point there tristan as well if you're looking at consumer applications and moving the haptics into an inner soul, then you could twin that with, say, uh, sport trackers and running development to use gait analysis and stride pace, which would allow you basically to have a non-visual cue to how fast you should be running relative to your heart rate, which would be a hugely consumer application for an incredible piece of kit that you've developed there for to support stroke. I mean, just to add to that, absolutely. And in fact, where this came from is the original version of this was for drummers and you had... Um, devices on each limb and a drummer could feel what another drummer was doing and could record what another drummer was doing and there are clear um, applications in sports that involve synchronization such as rowing and as you say stuff with animals the possibilities are indeed very wide there. You can drum along with a girl and stuff that sounds amazing. Um, I love it. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. I mean, in, in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll move on. But thank you very much, Simon. Um, what I would like to say is that, obviously, as I said, um, Simon's details will be distributed to everybody on the call. So by all means, get in touch. Uh, but by all means, 
you know, because it, it kind of feels like that there could be a little bit of a consortium uh, maybe coming together to, to help as well. We, as the SEC, would obviously be delighted to facilitate that. So if anybody, um, you know, wants to get in touch with us or, or express an interest or anything like that, we're very happy to facilitate all of that sort of stuff. So please get in touch, either with Simon directly or with us, and, and we'll see what we can do to, uh, to put things forward. But that was uh, very, very interesting. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, so I'd now like to hand over to um, Alan van der Merwe, um, fresh from his uh, heroics in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, which I presume you will touch upon. Um, but yeah, Alan, over, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pim. Uh, thanks for pronouncing my name so well as well. That's, uh, that's quite rare. Well, that's the um, uh, part of being Dutch, right? Um. <laughs> So I will uh, I will quickly share my screen. Can you see my screen? All right. Yeah, all good. Okay. So my name is Alan van der Merwe, and I'm one of the co-founders um, of Signal Biometrics. Um, we we work in Formula One and other motorsports, and we make wearable devices uh, that are intrinsically safe um, and practical to use in in pretty difficult environments. Um, so my, I'm going to be speaking more about, uh, more on the level of how we take these, these very interesting technologies that have been developed by very smart people, um, but that are potentially impractical for our use cases. So we work a lot on the integration side um, and trying to solve um, more of the logistical problems that arise when you make these, uh, these new wearable items. So a little bit of background. Um, I'm the guy on the left with the bad helmet hair. Um, to the right is Dr. Ian Roberts. Um, together, we, we've been working together now for about eight years. Um, Ian is the Formula One Medical Rescue Coordinator, and I'm essentially his, uh, his chauffeur. Um, we, uh, we work together at all Grand Prix um, to make sure that the medical car um, is at the scene as quickly as possible so that Ian um, and the local rescue crews can um, potentially perform some kind of life-saving um, some kind of life-saving work and during our time um, we we've spoken a lot about how we could potentially improve um, how we do things um, everything in formula one is about speed uh, it's continuously evolving um, it's not it's not static at all so we're constantly dealing with new novel problems and we've always thought that some kind of um, consistent and very very usable data would allow us to uh, to do some quick decision making. So this is our our regular our office is is the Silver Estate um, at the back of the grid there. This is a Sunday uh, the race start um, of a Formula One race, um, and Ian and I will follow the first lap around um, to make sure that we're on scene as quickly as possible um, at any kind of an unfortunate event. Um, this is an image that um, a lot of you might have seen in the last couple of weeks. This is uh, Romain Grosjean, who had a uh, very spectacular crash uh, in Bahrain. Um, his, his car essentially disintegrated upon impact um, and went through the barrier. And 100 kilos of fuel um, was, was going up uh, very quickly. And luckily, we were there within eight seconds. Um, and we had incredibly good fire support from the local marshals. And Roman managed to get out uh, without any uh, any life-threatening injuries. So this is this is actually a very easy intervention for us because we just have to turn up. We didn't actually have to do anything. Uh, Roman did most of the work himself, and a lot of the systems that have been developed over decades uh, they all work perfectly. So this isn't really uh, why we exist. Um, we would be more there for a, a very novel type of accident which requires um, quick thinking. Um, and where there are many avenues that could potentially be quite uh, quite high risk. So this is a better example um, of what we face. This is 2015 uh, in Russia, and the car under those barriers there is, is a driver called Carlos Sainz Jr. He had a 46G deceleration, which is huge. It was at the time uh, the biggest accident that we'd uh, recorded with our accelerometers. Um, and actually everything worked as it should um, the only thing that didn't work well was the retention of the barrier system so when we arrived um, we were faced with not being able to see Carlos uh, not being able to reach him and all of the car systems were were powered off so we essentially had no real information to go on do we move quickly um, at potentially great risk to Carlos or do we uh, move slowly and methodically remove the barriers 
um, whilst keeping everybody everybody healthy. So this was the impetus for us to explore wearables uh, in Formula One. You'd be surprised uh, to know, but actually Formula One is, is archaic when it comes to um, wearable devices. Um, there's currently only one on the drivers and that's the one we developed. Um, before that, there was literally nothing. Um, and this is due to the, uh, the environment being heavily regulated for fire safety and crash safety. So there are a lot of challenges that mean you cannot just take consumer tech and put it into this environment. So we, we did ask for expressions of interest um, and this ran for about five or six years and we had amazing concepts pitched to us. Um, and most of them turned out to be either impractical um, or just far too expensive because the, the environment sort of pulls you down that route. So I took it upon myself to, to try and make a proof of concept of what I thought a wearable should be in this kind of environment. Um, and we thought at the time that it should be, it should borrow as much as possible from consumer tech because consumer tech now is actually leading the way in, um, in how things are done. It's no longer industries like Formula One, which are feeding consumer tech. It's actually the other way around. So we wanted to take, we wanted to take a single sensor, um, so a single site, so that we would have a simple project um, and get the most value from a single sensor. So we chose, uh, we chose the hand. Um, so you can see Lewis Hamilton here pulling on his gloves. Um, what you cannot see is that inside those gloves, there is a very small, flexible, fireproof sensor, which sits directly on his skin, um, and a wearable device, which we developed for this purpose. Um, and this is, this is the device, it's called the HB1. Um, it's, a, it's a clinical monitor, so it, it uses electronics that are found in the clinical monitors that you would see in a hospital. Um, it gives us very simple metrics, gives us pulse rate, it gives us blood oxygenation, and it gives us motion. Um, and what those uh, metrics allow us to do is to see whether the driver has been conscious, um, whether they're still breathing, whether their airway is free, um, and also to see whether they have any kind of uh, cardiac issues that we might not be able to see when we initially get there. Um, it's developed specifically for accident and rescue. It's not a performance device. Um, and this is the other thing that we grappled with a little bit is most consumer devices are designed um, to put out a number at all times. And this, this sort of data is not, in our view, not the way to go for professional applications. Um, we don't want to have uh, a number that has been sanitized and, and massaged too heavily um, and that could actually lead you down an incorrect path. So we, we like to put out um, very, very raw, but very simple metrics. And the other main point is um, it's wireless and it's battery powered. Uh, we wanted this to work so that it didn't rely on all of the other complex uh, um, systems that are in Formula One, uh, because very often the accidents that we were faced with, uh, they're catastrophic. So lots of those systems don't work anymore. So it's, it's relatively small. Um, it only weighs 21 grams, which is about 21 grams too heavy for Formula One drivers. Um, they hate having new things on them. Teams are you know, spending millions to reduce the weight of the car. So a lot of these things were considerations. How do we make something really small that's going to be um, capable enough in this environment? Um, it's fire resistant. It gives us six hours of continuous uh, clinical type monitoring. Um, and surprisingly, it has 500 meters of wireless range uh, for a Bluetooth device, which is, um, which is not on the consumer level. Um, so the, at the core of this, uh, we, we made some very early decisions is that we weren't going to build uh, everything uh, ourselves. Um, it's quite tempting to do that, to build an incredibly optimized device. Um, but we thought that we'd be better served to focus on the packaging um, using our domain expertise and also focus on uh, just writing code rather than having to design complex uh, hardware designs. So it's a, we, the, the heart of the device is essentially a microcontroller um, it's pre-certified, which means we don't have to go through uh, long processes of um, um, making sure that our designs are intrinsically safe and not interfering with other systems. Um, and this is one of the main reasons why we were able to reduce the time to market. Um, we developed prototypes uh, in approximately six weeks, um, and we showed people a functional glove uh, within about eight to 10 weeks. Um, and the device after after 18 months of development um, was made mandatory. So all of the drivers are now wearing it. 
Um, the other the other considerations were that we wanted to make use of um, uh, capabilities on the device itself. We didn't want to be streaming huge amounts of data. Um, as most of you will know, Bluetooth is a uh, is at times a very frustrating um, uh, protocol to use. You're trying to pair your phone with your car, and it's it's quite finicky. So we wanted to solve these problems. Uh, and what we have is a, is a very robust um, and professional connectivity uh, device. Um, we do our own encryption on the fly, making use of these very impressive little MCUs. Uh, we can actually do things in real time, um, even on device signal processing. So we can really condense the data down into very small amounts of information that we can throw very far. Another key part of the device um, is incredibly simple, um, but it's proving to, to show a huge amount of value. Um, and that's a, a very high G uh, accelerometer. So we can record um, the impact velocities and durations uh, that the drivers experience. And we can also use this accelerometer for things like power management. Um, we wanted to make the device um, essentially completely error free. We didn't want the, the user to be able to switch it on or off or forget to switch it on. Um, so the device is, is aware of its context, how it's being used. Um, so the only thing you can really do is charge the device and put it into the glove. There's nothing else to be done. That was important, uh, in, an important part of our development process. So the accelerometer is, um, although a very small uh, part of, of the, the overall picture, it's turning out to be very valuable because it's, um, it's often a very uh, simple metric to uh, to deduce um, how severe an accident was um, and it can lead you down different clinical paths. So that's led us into actually developing the concept further. Um, what we do now is we've developed a, a very rapid process for molding custom earpieces and we've taken the tech that is in the glove and we're fitting it into um, custom made earpieces. Uh, they're very soft silicon. They have the driver's audio uh, embedded. Um, it has the same pulse oximetry as in the glove, so we can see blood oxygenation from the ear and pulse. Um, but the interesting part is we're now doing some interesting things with concussion detection. Um, so we, we're really interested in being able to quantify um, the, the risk of brain injury uh, with drivers. And something as simple as an accelerometer can, uh, can lead you down some, some, interesting, uh, some interesting studies and, and clinical paths. So this, this is all um, quite interesting, uh, but I've always, I always say this uh, internally, is that the hardware part takes up a lot of time, um, but it's actually just a necessary evil. Uh, I think wearables are great in that they can generate data, um, but then you're generating huge amounts of data. What, what is the actual value of it? Um, so one of our um, key objectives was to develop something that was going to give you uh, very usable and very valuable data. Um, we almost try and not think too much about the hardware. It's more about what is the user going to get from this um, and how is it going to improve the process? Uh, we don't like to, we already have, uh, our medical car looks a little bit like the inside of an Apple store. We've got iPads everywhere, we have iPhones everywhere, and more data is not necessarily good. Um, what we need is being able to get the correct type of data to the right people at the right time. So at, at its um, most basic form, um, all of our technology is wireless and it works with consumer apps. Uh, which initially was very difficult for people in Formula One to accept um, because they're used to using their, their phones as a consumer device. But we're now doing some very, very interesting uh, things with uh, iPhones and iPads that are reading from our, from our sensors. So we've come up with something which is um, quite different in that if we speak of Fitbits and things like that, they're designed for uh, essentially one-to-one -one connectivity. Usually one consumer will have their own device and their applications will speak to that one device. Um, in our case, we've designed something which introduces more complexity because it's many-to-many. -many. We can essentially have 40, 50, or 100 sensors speaking to uh, 10, 20, or 30 devices. So um, it's more... Um, it's it's more useful in a professional environment where you would like people to have access to data when they need it as opposed to on an individual basis. So this leads us on to uh, 
a kind of a natural progression. Obviously, Formula One is great. Um, it's not a uh, it's not a huge business opportunity for us. We've never wanted to build a business purely around motorsport. Um, I see a, a large opportunity here to take what we what we've developed and our learnings from Formula One um, and actually bring it to wider markets. Um, and healthcare is an obvious one because our first our first product is a is a healthcare uh, type sensor. So we're now developing, um, and this is in trials now in the NHS, um, we've developed a derivative of the, um, of the HB1, and we're using the core concepts uh, as it is in Formula One. So it's the same connectivity, it's the same uh, idea that you only need an iPad or an iPhone and you can monitor uh, hundreds of patients uh, simultaneously. Um, the main difference is we, we've had to make the form factor more suitable um, to healthcare. So the device is quite a lot larger and it accepts other types of uh, probes which are um, not foreign to, um, to clinical users. Uh, we want this to be an understandable concept um, for people that are, are used to using these probes, um, but just enable them to scale this a, a lot wider um, so this is this is where we're going. I, I see what we're developing um, as allowing us to to scale this now into industries that are are actually quite slow in the adoption of new technology. Um, and it's surprising when we pitched this to the NHS, um, they had no idea that this sort of thing existed. So this is our our next leg is uh, hopefully to to bring this to to much wider markets. So that's uh, that's it from me. If you have any any questions, excellent. Thank you, uh, Alan. Really good presentation. Very very interesting. Um, there was one question that came in um, during your presentation from Duncan Banks, um, saying, "Alan, with a five hundred meter range, do you have several aerials around the racing circuit to pick up any of the signal wireless communication?" Um, yes and no. So. Um, because this is a medical, uh, because this is a rescue device, um, we, we aren't that interested in picking up data when the cars are actually going around. Um, we know that if a driver is, is, uh, is still driving, that their airway is fine and that they're obviously quite healthy. Um, what we do have is uh, foot doctors and uh, other intervention vehicles have our um, application running. Um, and uh, those devices pick up the signal and push it uh, in real time to our medical car. Um, so we have different ways of doing this, but our primary um, use case was to make sure that when we're on site, that we have an insight to what happened before we got there um, and what is happening in real time. So the, for that, the 500 meters range is, is perfectly usable. Excellent, makes sense. Um, this is something, so Les Gill asked a question and, and it was something that I was wondering about as well. Um, he's basically saying, are there any issues with sharing personal data? Because obviously you're capturing a lot of stuff that presumably not everybody is comfortable necessarily with you having or, or a fear of, of it getting out there or any of that sort of stuff. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, so uh, we, we grappled with this for quite a long time and actually delayed uh, the Formula One project by, by almost a year. Um, making the tech is actually the easy bit. It's finding practical ways to, to get it into the environment without it becoming some kind of a, a surveillance tool. Um, and so, especially with Formula One drivers, you can imagine someone like Lewis Hamilton does not want his data to be easily accessible to, to people he essentially doesn't know. So what we use in Formula One is actually very pared down. Uh, both Ian and myself do not have access to the data unless we really have to. Um, the information we see all the time is to see whether the system is functioning. Um, but when we arrive on scene, we have a way to get into the proper data very rapidly. Um, and this is all audited, so we can see who looked at the data and when they did. But yes, this is a huge concern, especially in, in professional environments where you might be told that you have to wear this device. So there's, an, there's immediately a, a little bit of a barrier to acceptance. So we wanted this to be very, um, very easy to accept for the drivers and, and everybody is wearing it now. So we've uh, we've essentially have been successful with that, but we have to we have to chip away at it. We can't we can't get to where we we know we can be in one step. We have to really just chip away at this. Yeah, and presumably there's there's kind of a, a bit of an educational process as well to to ensure that the drivers feel comfortable and and, and safe, and, and indeed not just driving, but any potential other users as well. I guess. 
That's it, exactly. So, I mean, what we started with in the beginning, what we pitched to them was actually quite scary um, because it was data everywhere for everyone. And it's impressive on a, um, on a technical level. But what we started out with um, practically was very pared down. It was essentially just Ian with a, with a, with a device and he was the only user. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's part of the learning process. I think um, most tech businesses go through that. Yeah, excellent. So um, Stefan Lombard is, is asking whether you're based in the UK and whether it has any applications with um, MOD. Yes, yeah, so we uh, we actually incubated this business uh, at Silverstone. Uh, this is about three years ago. I had an office there and uh, I did a lot of experimentation with things and figuring out how to do this. Uh, we're now based in London. Uh, that's mainly for, for personal and logistical reasons. Um, but we're very much involved in the UK um, motorsports and, um, and industry. Excellent. Um, just a question from uh, Chris Beattie now as well. Um, Alan, is this used in F1 only at the moment? Um, IndyCar has a G-Sensor earpiece, but I'm sure they and others would be interested in expanded metrics um, that Signal looks to provide, um, especially in multi-car accidents and prioritizing driver care. Yes, so um, this, the, the glove itself is only used uh, in FIA championships, so Formula E and Formula One, um, but we are speaking to a lot of other um, series about introducing it. Rally is a big one. Um, ironically, Formula One doesn't really need this tech the most. Um, it's things like rally where you have a huge logistical problem uh, getting to some of the drivers. So in the next two to three years, this will roll out um, stepwise to other, other industries. Um, and we're helping in, improve the, the G-sensors and the earpieces in other industries too. Excellent, thank you. Um, Julian comes in with a, with a topical question for, for him. Um, in terms of looking at future development, where time and accurate measurement is paramount, would an exploration of quantum technologies, i.e. optical clocks, have a role to play? Wow. Um, I think I don't really is in a position to help you with that. Should you, should you want? No, no, um, I, I'm, I'm, I love tech, and I love um, trying to do things with with new tech that uh, gives you a big step change. But where we often find we're, we're actually solving very boring problems. I find um, we take uh, pulse oximetry has been around for decades. Um, and so the problem we're solving is not actually making novel sensors or novel ways of, of measuring things. The real problem that Signal is currently solving is how do we make this scalable? How do we make this scalable in a particular environment? Um, so we do quite a lot of R&D uh, into some quite novel and exotic things. Um, not optical clocks, I'll be honest. I'll have to look that up after this. Um, but I think for now, we're still really trying to solve very basic, actually quite boring problems, because that seems to be what most businesses are, are still grappling with. Everyone has, uh, the NHS has incredibly old problems like um, a nurse doing the rounds. You know, that's actually a physical activity rather than automating it with remote monitoring. Thank you for that. Um, Teresa is wondering if you could mention which NSS trust you're working with. Are you comfortable with that? Or I mean, we can do that offline if, if you prefer. Uh, the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll be uh, we're still putting together the agreements, um, but they're they're a very interesting trust in that they have some uh, some great departments that are are really keen on using this this type of technology. Well, I mean, certainly what we can do is facilitate an interaction between you and Teresa um, and also with Stefan, um, because he's, he's suggesting that the number of, of government departments that, that you should be uh, connected to. So um, we can certainly help help with that and facilitate that. Um, does anybody else have any comments or questions that I would like to ask? Yeah, I had um, a little one. Um, the, the, the picture you showed of the NHS example was quite interesting. I was wondering what your plan was around the pairing of that, since they didn't seem to have displays. Would they be tied to a bed, or would you try to tie them to a patient's name? What's, what's your general thoughts on that one? A very good question. Um, so the, this is what I touched on, is that we, by making this, this equipment so portable and so, uh, so scalable, you introduce all sorts of new logistical problems. Um, and we try to solve those by uh, retaining some form of uh, tactile interaction. So what we do is the devices can be placed near, um, let's say you have your phone, you can place them next to each other and they essentially, you can identify devices easily. 
Um, but the devices in our trials will be paired to a patient, um, much in the way that um, a drug would be dispensed. It will be double checked against their, uh, their ID. Um, but yeah, this is actually part, a big part of our study is, is to identify uh, what kind of new problems we've actually created by making this, this stuff so, uh, so scalable and portable. Very good. Um, any other questions or comments from anybody? Right, okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Um, very, very informative. Um, really appreciate um, you, you joining us today. Um, excellent stuff. Uh, so we'll now move on to our final speaker, which is um, Alex Watson from Future Electronics. So, Alex, over to you, please. Sure, let me just share my screen. So, put this on full screen so everyone can see it. Um, so hi guys, uh, Alex Watson, Future Electronics. I head up our sensor solutions team. So this will be probably a different tack to some of the other presentations we've had in that we'll look to focus on the technologies um, and the enabling sensors behind some of these products and some of these um, projects that we've looked at today. So I'll just give you a quick introduction to who we are, look at the state of wearables today, some of the technology trends in that space. Uh, and then we'll look at some specific products at the center sort of surface mount board level that are enabling some of these functions and furthering the development in that space. So uh, integration of uh, machine learning and AI at the sensor side, and then some um, integrated medical grade uh, sensing, but in terms of vital sign measurement uh, and temperature sensors. So future, some of you may know, um, if you have a distribution channel or you've ever worked, uh, we are a broad line distributor of lots of different um, semiconductor manufacturers. The benefit obviously there is that we have a view to lots of markets, lots of customers um, and lots of different developments across different suppliers. Uh, the challenge being we have to differentiate ourselves from the arrows and the abnets and digi keys of this world. And the way we choose to do that is by heavily investing in engineering expertise. Before I came to Future uh, to be a sensor specialist, I worked for Texas Instruments uh, in the field supporting customers uh, as you know, very broad line uh, semiconductor manufacturer. Some of these names you'll recognize, some of them perhaps not. People like NXP, AMS, um, Bosch, ST, very, very prevalent in the wearable space and the high volume consumer tech space. Um, and then some others such as Amphenol, Malexis, FLIR, um, more specialist spaces or tailored towards more automotive or industrial. So the reason I'm talking to you today is because I have a view to and um, knowledge of all of these sensor types. So it could be anything from uh, air quality and gas sensing, temperature and humidity to the more common in wearable spaces such as uh, biometric, capacitive detection, resistive sensing, um, proximity, um, accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, IMUs, um, and then everything, all of the above in terms of uh, wearable sensing. So moving into trends, I say classifying what a wearable is has probably become as much a challenge these days as uh, historically it was quite simple. It was only two or three things available on the market. But today it could be the convergence of biotech, uh, continuous glucose monitoring was mentioned by uh, Tristan in his presentation. Uh, Simon's presentation touches on the um, integration of wearables, prosthetics and medical aids. Um, you've got safety uh, and security in uh, things like the whole thing helmets, where as you fall off, the accelerometer triggers an airbag and uh, you use that as a form of wearable protection. AR and VR, the integration and prevalence or sort of resurgence of smart glasses after Google didn't do very well with it. Um, is, that technology is coming back. Hearables um, becoming a huge area of development, as obviously uh, we saw from Alan, uh, they're moving into the ear in that detection space. And then you've got the more conventional smartwatches, the fitness trackers, um, and then the insole um, steps as well for shoes. So a lot of the topics that were covered today, and then maybe some more revolutionary ones such as uh, smart textiles and um, intelligent clothing. So embedded sensors, patches, fabrics that are able to react to and monitor um, the wearer's vital signs, their body, their movements, um, companies like Stretch Sense model the resistive nature of flexible bands to actually determine movement. So they have a smart glove, but it can be modeled over the whole body. Um, so wearables are changing in nature as much as the technology that enables them. Just a quick overview on sort of uh, how that market looks from an opportunity perspective. 
So um, the global fitness tracker market is roughly $30 billion in 2019, accepted more than double in size. Uh, hearables, 20, uh, $21 billion in 2018, again, more than double. A lot of these figures, I mean, people of business, we, we take figures with a pinch of salt, right? But um, augmented reality, AR and VR with a combined market size of in excess um, in excess of 20 billion and then medical healthcare and smart patches to be probably the largest one growing to 139 billion in 2026. The key thing to note here is that a lot of these markets share numbers. There's a massive convergence of these technologies into each other's spaces, starting with fitness trackers and moving into the medical healthcare uh, and the smart patches space um, and hearables and some of this uh, audible technology moving into the augmented and virtual reality space as well. So all of these markets prevail, but are cannibalistic of each other as well. So one of the things I wanted to highlight here is just going into each of those segments as they are defined, um, some more common wearables um, market is the challenges and then the sensor types that are prevalent in that space uh, and that are being developed. So for fitness trackers and smartwatches, uh, their key challenge is much like the saturation of the mobile phone market, Apple introduced the smartwatch and validated, uh, validated the smartwatch market with their Apple Watch. And since then, you have this um, integration and emergence of key players, um, competitive market and common functionality. So the core challenge is always increasing that functionality, increasing the battery life whilst maintaining a standardized form factor that is syn synonymous with watches. Uh, and then the integration now of much higher quality data that then takes from the emerging trends of fitness tracking, um, telemedicine, and um, this competitive running that things like Strava have brought about as well. So competitive activity is becoming a huge platform and a huge justifying factor for fitness, um, for smartwatches, as well as the base fitness tracking. So in, a, in any given smartwatch, uh, you'll have an accelerometer and gyroscope, which will be combined probably in a six axis IMU. You have a magnetometer, which is uh, used in tandem with an accelerometer to provide e-compass functionality. So uh, that can be used for bearing and heading as well as pedestrian dead reckoning for GPS tracking. Proximity sensors for wake up. You've got a camera module in some of the um, more common now in some of the Asian um, smartwatch manufacturers. You'll have uh, gesture and touch control, um, which is now we look at the emerging trends in that space. Um, biosensors for vital sign tracking, which now moving up to say uh, the ability to do say blood pressure in a um, it, without using a cuff. So still using an actual um, single point blood pressure monitoring system is going to be um, possible as well. Uh, and then temperature, microphone pressure um, in the AR and VR space. So as I mentioned before, you're seeing smart glasses starting to come back into that market, very much classified as a wearable, whereas VR is probably arguably more training, uh, um, more for the training and for gamification of activities. But you still have challenges that come down to the core sensor. So you have enhanced stability, so uh, horizon tracking, you've got eye tracking, so actually monitoring where the user's uh, looking. Uh, and adapting accordingly, and then real-world, uh, real-time analytics for smart glasses, which all presents a data processing challenge, and the, and the integration of edge AI can be used to um, create continuous loops of data that are inferred from user activity rather than having to continuously update from cloud. So again, very much common types here. The only real addition uh, versus your smartwatch would be an IR and an RGB sensitive camera. Um, so put RBG, but it should be RGB. Um, and then the integration of haptic feedback for guidance, um, again, touching back to some of what um, Simon was looking at. So hearables, much more challenge, uh, much more of a challenge here in terms of uh, battery life, size, weight, and heat dissipation are absolutely critical. There's a comfort factor uh, and a, a sort of usability factor that can't really be breached um, in hearable technologies. Otherwise, it just becomes unviable. Um, and then... Optim it's an absolutely optimal uh, collection point for an awful lot of uh, biosensor integration up to and including now if you're looking at um, electro for brain activity monitoring. Um, it's again a, a critical point of acquisition for um, temperature, vital signs, um, and also for tracking progress of things like um, infections. Uh, and obviously the EMT passages are more, some of the more common infections in spaces that are uh, 
affected in uh, minors and adults. So again, accelerometers for, uh, for the power consumption aspect, you've got active noise cancellation with the ear and earbuds, active noise cancellation for loose fit when you have a feed forward or feedback topology for noise cancellation has become even more challenging when you can't guarantee, um, can't actually guarantee that that space is enclosed. So you get feedback and feed forward on the corrective loop for those microphones, which has to be corrected. Companies like AMS are working on this um, for, and people like Bose as well. Uh, touch and gesture control, obviously to the ear, it has to be very intuitive. It has to be moderately agnostic of um, direction, highly responsive and highly reliable. And then again, tighter temperature and biosensors. And finally, for medical healthcare and smart patches, so more in tandem and more in line with the conversations we've been having today. Um, this is the expectation with the convergence into the consumer market. It's a lower cost, um, lower cost solution, certainly for this um, disposable and pseudo disposable market. Um, ultra low power, uh, a lot of the patches you're moving towards energy harvesting based power acquisition rather than supplying from a battery. Uh, or thin film lithium polymer printed batteries, which are much, um, much narrower, you have much lower peak currents, um, high accuracy, high reliability and medical grade conformance. But again, now um, one of the largest developing markets of all those um, figures I gave you earlier in terms of market sizes of X billion, um, of that, oh, the sensors themselves is only 10 billion. So that shows you the cost challenge in um, markets that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars. There's a huge cost challenge and a huge um, onus on, supply, on sensor manufacturers to differentiate and also maintain um, competitive costs. If you're looking at maybe an average of five sensors per application, uh, it can't cost the same as the MCU. It can't cost the same as the uh, wireless transceiver. Um, and yeah, a lot of these are common across all of them, which makes them a lot easier to discuss. So from a market trend perspective, uh, I've tried to map the market trend to the technology trend here. So uh, in wearables, in fitness tracking, in AI and VR, you have AI analytics for activity recognition and gamification. So these are essentially uh, localized analytics specific to the player, the user, um, that basically differentiate them and their activity from everyone else's. So reliably monitoring on say, <clears throat> let's say I'm using a platform like Fit, where <clears throat> I'm following a activity on the TV and I'm being um, tracked based on my uh, my use. If I have a watch that they've provided me that doesn't actually learn, then I'm just setting um, my activity to nominal uh, data patterns and nominal um, stored sequences that they have for everyone. Now that can be very, very frustrating and you're gonna go off the entire business model of that platform if say, uh, every time you do a workout, it only tracks half your repetitions, you're not seeing that competitive feedback, you're not seeing your progression, um, it becomes very frustrating. So using reliable AI uh, and edge AI analytics on motion data to improve the performance of a sensor after deployment, rather than just being a generic um, go-to-market product that supplements software, it makes a huge difference um, in user experience. And the technology trend here is sort of system level peripheral AI integrated at the sensor rather than being translated from uh, software or uh, ultimately from the cloud as well. Uh, medical grade consumer tech, as we've already talked about, and I, I think a lot of you will uh, be familiar with the convergence of the uh, medical and the wearable space. Uh, I think Apple Watch, the most recent advert very much touts the ability to measure um, blood oxygenation levels, obviously you have heart rate variability for stress levels, uh, standard HRM, PPG and ECG monitoring as well. Um, but as you move into that consumer space, you no longer have the allowable um, sort of cost point in the markup ad that comes with the medical space. Um, and so you need to be able to provide high precision, small form factor sensors that are also able to comply with the specifications for medical regulations or ultimately are become medically pre-certified to expedite time to market for your customers. Um, micro form factor wearable, hearable sensors and smart patches. As we talked about before, it's ultra low power sensor components with high speed interface for system level power savings. So not just considering the sensor as a standalone element anymore, it is its place within the system and how it enables that entire system to be smaller, to be lower cost, to be less complex. And that's the absorption of capability that commonly would have been held at the host MCU. 
uh, enhanced gesture recognition and user interface expansion. So this comes with um, advanced haptic feedback solutions, companies like Oxford Ultra Haptics, where they're working on the ability to interact in free space and provide haptic feedback. Um, combined with low power gesture detection sensing, some of you may have seen Google's project Solly and can tandem with Infineon. Companies like Akineer, um, NXP and TI able to use uh, narrowband um, radar in a 60 gig um, space, sorry, um, millimeter wave radar in that 60 gigahertz space to be able to do air gesture detection, things like bezel-less uh, interaction, which moves towards uh, both screenless and projected to skin technology. Um, it supplements that space where you have no real way of working in um, a human uh, machine interfaces in a simple form factor. And then finally, augmented reality and smart glasses plus the um, rise of VR. This is small form factor, high resolution image sensing for world basing applications. So that's your standard RGB sensors. Um, and then reduced resolution, so say, sub megapixel um, IR sensitive image sensors in the 940 and the 850 nanometer um, space for eye tracking and reliable um, horizon tracking as well. So in the next section, I'm only going to really focus on the first uh, products that enable the first three, as the second two points are very much, um, well, time constraint. I could be here all day talking about them. So from merging uh, machine learning and uh, machine learning and sensors themselves. So ST microelectronics, obviously huge range of sensors, everyone will know, uh, massively prevalent in the market for MEMS, uh, whether it be pressure, temperature, humidity, um, it can be uh, accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, and whether they be standalone or in um, six axis or nine axis configurations for um, inertial measurement, they have lots of options. The newer developments in this space for them is the integration of what they call a machine learning core into their product. So what you have is a, up to uh, eight decision trees um, based on, um, so essentially based on finite state machines, you can construct up to 16 independent finite state machines uh, and eight simultaneous um, decision trees, which allows you to input um, sensor sample data, program the sensor itself with an attribute relation file, which essentially models nominal movements, um, uh, frequency thresholds, G thresholds, uh, and use metadata analytics to put together a profile of a movement that is then programmed into the sensor. Uh, and in some cases can be used to um, generate a feedback loop where you can learn new activities that you then program into the sensor again. Um, the advantage of this is that ultimately, if you were to do that activity recognition in software, you have a slightly lower sensor power consumption, but you are massively um, putting that, the onus onto your MCU. So you have a higher, a higher performance MCU, you're significantly increasing the traffic on the serial bus, and you're increasing your battery usage because you're relying on the MCU being awake for all of these, um, all of these activities. Whereas if you were to use um, uh, if you're to you if you're to run these activities in the sensor itself then you have similar power consumption but you'll be able to offload your mcu and mpu using a high speed interface such as i3c um, you're able to um, significantly decrease the wake up the time that the sensor is on you can use the uh, fifo that is built into a first in first out memory that's built into the sensor hub itself for the six axis sensors, this is often in the up to nine kilobytes and allows you to store uh, metadata events and also store uh, acceleration events or um, daisy chain other sensors onto the sensor hub. So you can collect any I squared C sensors data, humidity, temperature, barometric pressure, store that in the sensor until you have reached a significant threshold of events that could be considered an interrupt or a trigger for your core system to wake up. So in what you might desire to be a sleepy system where battery can power consumption is absolutely critical, this is a really good solution where you have a bit of uh, operational expenditure up front to invest in uh, programming the sensor and then significant system savings further down the line. So products in this family that are integrating um, this X core on the machine learning core, 
Um, I focused on the six axis IMUs because for wearables, this is probably the most relevant space. Uh, certainly if you look at some of the use cases for these products um, in wearables, you've got activity recognition. So state whether or not you're stationary, walking, jogging, um, driving, you've got gym acti activity recognition. So you can pre-program the sensor with things like curls, squats, uh, overhead press, um, and it will factor in the body range of movement and the number of repetitions done by the user. Uh, airplane detection, so takeoff, landing, whether or not you um, dynamically lock features relative to what someone's doing. And in also moving in a vehicle, whether or not you choose to have a, a limited user interface when someone is clearly driving. Um, for the DSRX, which is a higher performance than the DSOX, you have a higher stability gyroscope for things like head gestures and motion intensity. Uh, you're able to look in uh, motion tracking for robots and drones and controlling that from the sensor uh, and aftermarket vehicle tracking as well. So this is uh, the first two very much um, relevant to the wearable space and the last one more to the automotive. Um, and then the ISM, essentially anything from ST that has the sensors that has the I uh, prefix, there is an advantage to it whilst it's not dedicated to the wearable space for a lot of companies that I work with. Um, the consumer product life cycle is a real challenge. So the I products from um, ST are essentially industrial variants, um, which match the silicon performance of the consumer um, ones, but they're tested more rigorously. And then the ultimate upside is that from the release of the product, you have a 10 year longevity program associated with that product, which means that after two, three years, when the um, smartphone that picks up these sensors is uh, designed out and they no longer selling that uh, sensor in volume, you're far less likely to see that sensor go out of production, which can be a real challenge, certainly for smaller companies um, and purchasing departments. We see a real um, constraint on resource if you're continuously redesigning to uh, negate obsolescence. Uh, a lot of these machine learning examples are available online um, and there's dedicated GitHub projects uh, for the machine learning core algorithms and you can load them through a really intuitive um, basically program the sensor through a really intuitive evaluation platform called the Unico GUI and you can also do algorithm generation using what they have there's a visual algorithm builder that allows you to simplify the programming and these can be work used in tandem with programming tools such as Kyle and IAR. So I run through it there, but um, one thing to note is that there is a new uh, product coming out in this family, the LI, uh, LSM6 DSUX, um, and that'll incorporate a new technology called QVAR. And QVAR, it stands for charge variance. Um, and what you're basically using is you have electrodes on available, you can interface electrodes to the sensor and using this AI, um, the, using the AI core, you can program the sensor to be contextually aware due to charge variants uh, relative to human body presence or presence of the human body to other materials and items. So as you're moving around, um, the humans, this can be used to supplement step counting. Uh, it, uh, you see a charge variance, whether positive or negative, um, in accordance with proximity to other objects. Um, and what it is, it can be used for reliable swim detect uh, in detection of swimming. It can be used as a proximity function. It can be used to detect when someone is actually wearing a device or not, um, because the human body uh, is a huge um, factor to play in this charge variance. Uh, and you can detect it using electrodes on the body or electrodes in proximity to the sensor. So this is a truly unique uh, functionality that's built into these sensors that differs from anything available from their competition and a very new way of looking at the charge uh, and the capacity sensitivity of MEMS sensors and how that uh, can be used to monitor the electric potential around the sensor itself. So from that side, um, going into the smart IMU, so Bosch, um, SenseTech, the largest player in the MEMS space. Um, so I see some people are messaging, but I'll have a look in the, uh, have a look at these in the uh, Q&A session at the end. Um, so Bosch, essentially massive advocate for MEMS uh, motion sensing in, and they have dedicated ranges, just not just in wearables, but also now looking at the longevity challenges of industrial, um, big in automotive and uh, really, really big in the AR and the robotic space as well. Um, so some of the things you expect from a six axis IMU, uh, accelerometer plus gyroscope, 
would be uh, low power consumption, so sub, uh, less than 1.2 milliamp for IMU plus orientation detection. That is low, it's not as low as you can be. Um, they, this is a high performance sensor. And one of the key challenges that you'll see the, for this versus uh, comparing to a simple sensor is that this actually integrates a uh, core MCU to do all the sensor fusion um, and generate interrupts and um, app, uh, basically to interface directly to things like um, Android where um, it can generate an awful lot of your um, software examples and your API integration come from the sensor itself. Uh, and you, but you can trim that back to very simple acceleration based gestures and uh, double tap, tap, double tap, uh, wake up on motion. And it can be used to control all of those. And they are very simple uh, designed to interface, as I said, to uh, wearable OSs. So you can use them to trigger interrupts on to your host MCU designed to simplify and expedite time to market. Some of the embedded functionality, you have uh, embedded sensor fusion. You also have a self-learning motion AI, which I'll touch on in a bit. Uh, pedestrian dead reckoning to supplement GPS. So this is automated pedestrian dead reckoning to do bearing and heading of people in wearable applications. So uh, obviously G GNSS um, is a very power hungry um, location um, technology. So if you're using GNSS and you want to duty cycle it, then you can use the sensor plus the MCU to do automated pedestrian dead reckoning and localize the person between um, GPS signal points, which will allow you to save considerable amount of power, but also improve reliability in system downtime uh, and swimming and anal analytics. So that's a dedicated um, dedicated uh, motion algorithm based around swimming. So lap count, stroke count, speed, etc. You can see here the basic structure. This is the AB, which is the um, non AI version of the uh, AP which as you can see here, integrates a, um, an M4 Cortex uh, MCU with 144K ROM and 256K RAM, high-speed SPI and I2C uh, for communication with your application processor, the acceleration, accelerometer and gyro silicon on board, and then up to 24 peripheral GPIO uh, for interrupt generation and interface to uh, the rest of your system. Uh, direct interface into flash memory. And you can also, as I said before, you can interface other sensors to this and use it as a hub. Uh, so button, uh, you can use buttons, PWM output, proximity light sensors, and also interface for GPS um, and other common wearable sensor types, magnetometer, pressure sensor as well. So the self-learning motion AI is designed to be a feature that is out an out-of-the-box activity based on pre-learned um, pre activities, uh, up to 50 common um, exercises that you can do. But one of the key things here is that you can initiate a training sequence for the sensor through uh, directly um, through the applications processor, which allows the user to then program new activities. So let's say you were in the gym and you're doing an activity that isn't in that set 50. You go into a training sequence, do two to three repetitions of that exercise in real time, store that data, the sensor will learn it, process it, and then use it as a programmable data set to basically output metadata such as rep count or performance count on that activity. So it's really designed to hugely simplify and expedite the learning of new activities and simplify the training process of machine learning in situ for that sensor instead of having to release them as uh, software updates, you can also uh, collect all of that data. And then if you wanted to do OTA updates as you've collected, um, say hundreds of up more data points, you could potentially collect that and distribute that as an OTA update to your product in um, further iterations or further software updates. Again, pedestrian dead reckoning focused around uh, power consumption, you save up to 80% of the battery um, if, the GPS, if the GNSS transceiver can be kept in um, sleep mode uh, and allows for more stable navigation. So that's again an, an embedded function to that sensor. The medical quality sensors. So this is this moving away from the MEM side of what we're looking at. So some of the uh, trends in smart health sensing uh, and the technologies there very much. The opportunity as we've discussed in this uh, most of the calls today uh, you have a lack of physicians and some of the cost pressure in the health system, um, the challenge or the um, desire of the uh, of people to do their own pipe, their own monitoring, their own diagnosis. 
Um, but you have preventative medicine being hugely uh, encouraged and promoted to save cost on um, health services and also the opportunity to develop algorithms and integrate algorithms into lots of wearable platforms um, that can be used by health providers, insurers and end users in the consumer space. So the trends there, medical grade um, sort of clinically certified consumer devices, uh, more data than just standard heart rate monitoring. So the integration of ECG, blood pressure, um, respiratory rate uh, and um, saturated oxygen all in single sensors. So because we still have the size constraints, more measuring points. So just wrist, ear, finger, chest straps um, and continuous measurement there as well. So standard use cases that we we're looking at before health and fitness and the preventative medicine and telemedicine space. So one of the examples of supplementary simple sensing that is very much becoming prevalent in um, fitness tracking and certainly post COVID society is the ability to accurately derive um, body temperature from skin temperature. And this requires to, uh, to be medically certified. It requires an accuracy of plus or minus 0 0.01, uh, sorry, 0 0.1 um, degrees Celsius accuracy. Uh, again, very much tend to be working in devices with um, sort of 1.8 volt power rails, so coin cell batteries, um, and a requirement for very small packages. So the one advantage is uh, one advantage of a small package temperature sensor with high accuracy is that you have a very small thermal mass, which negates self heating, which means higher accuracy, lower drift. But one of the other challenges is that when you have a small thermal mass, it's stability and cross sensitivity to uh, board design. So in a small design, you have a battery, you might have a wireless transceiver and a Bluetooth sent, uh, Bluetooth transceiver, um, and then the display, uh, all of that generates heat. So how you're able to offset, calibrate and ensure the reliability of that sensor is critical in the performance of a wearable system. Um, so high accuracy digital temperature sensors um, offer a lot of, uh, well, offer a simplified solution to a lot of these challenges by being able to provide um, factory calibration, uh, easy to use, uh, high responsivity sensors, uh, small form factors with large, um, large solder pads to simplify integration, alert pins and control logic embedded in the sensor. And this essentially stops you from having to do all your own configuration, calibration and thermal offset measure, um, programming for something like a cheap NTC or a PTC where you may get the responsivity responsivity, but your part to part variability matching across the life cycle of the product, your drift characteristics, none of that will be assured. So proving that the sensor will not drift within a certain um, within a certain range over the life cycle of your product, which is critical for maintaining the accuracy curve required for clinical integration is very difficult um, without running all your own tests and your clinical trials. So using a clinically trialed medical uh, grade accuracy temperature sensor simplifies that. And then you can overlay your body temperature to skin temperature algorithm to make the data more relevant. Um, and then you're good to go. So AMS have the AS6221 being released uh, now, which is uh, fits into this. It's a progression of their um, standard AS6200 family uh, of temperature sensors, just with high, uh, much higher accuracy in the 20 degrees to 42 degree um, human body temperature range. And then Maxim, uh, another lead player in this space. So the, MX, yeah, uh, the Max 3028 is essentially um, kind of the market leader in this at this point and has some nice features such as unique factory program 64-bit registration number for identification uh, and supply chain tracking, uh, high and low temperature alarm configuration. So if you want to set threshold alarms, um, it is larger than the AMS solution, but also has um, a similar power consumption down to 500 nanoamps average power consumption at um, a quarter hertz duty cycle um, and then really really strong in the repeatability uh, um, categories but it is um, it is compliant to um, basically it's clinically compliant which is very good for um, immediate integration into products so moving on to the last topic of this um, so this is vital sign measurement um, so there's a couple of ways of doing vital sign measurement. You can either have a fully integrated ASIC plus photodiode plus LED, uh, wafer level optics uh, and lens integration to allow you to have a standalone solution, as well as integrating all of the uh, algorithms directly into that module. Um, the advantages of this technology is it's simple and easy to use. 
Um, it optimizes some of the form factor requirements. Uh, and if you have no experience of integrating um, vital sign monitoring, it is much simpler and makes, uh, makes the technology more accessible to you. The only difficulty it does present is that by not doing a semi-discrete or discrete, you're not optimizing the solution for your use, uh, your end user. So you will have some challenges with uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, power consumption is potentially not optimized, um, and ultimately the performance will be compromised versus a discrete solution. But it's a very good way to get started in this space and obviously scalable to do uh, first iterations of products, you can then move to a discrete or semi-discrete approach. So the AS7030 is kind of there to market um, heart rate monitoring plus ECG in one sensor. Then you have the 7038 and the 7038 GB, which are semi-discrete ASIC plus the photodiode. And then you interface an external uh, LED. The GB and the RB represent red, blue, green, blue. So you're two different, or four, three different wavelengths for heart rate monitoring. Again, small pro, uh, very small products, integration of the um, photodiode and the ASIC but it allows the flexibility um, and the ability to um, calibrate for external ambient light interference is a lot easier when you have external LEDs. Uh, solution dimensions can be adapted to in-ear or um, other more complex optical designs uh, and multi-sensor input. Um, and then your LED colors can be chosen based on your application. And then finally, the product that hasn't been released yet and all information available is under NDA is the 7050, which is a purely discrete approach, similar to how Maxim go to market. This is a high performance analog front end that basically will be twinned with a, um, a controller. So all of the uh, algorithms are stored separately. So the 7050 will do all of the control, all of the interface and all of the um, conversion measurement and algorithmic calculation and derivation of heart rate monitoring, SpO2 max, ECG, blood pressure, and input from multi-wavelength sensors, um, but you will have to do the LED design. This offers significant advantages in terms of uh, reducing the signal to noise ratio, providing much higher dynamic range and lower power consumption, but leaves more work for you to do as an end customer. So um, some advantages certainly in that small hearable, uh, where high performance wearable space, but some disadvantages in terms of how much work you have to put in to realize it. You'll get these slides, so I won't go into full detail, but as you can see, you have the integrated LED drivers on the 7038, and then the rest of it is based around control, um, and you get the off-the-shelf um, hardware and the algorithms to do uh, all your conversion for heart rate, SpO2, sleep apnea, and pulse oximetry. There's a development kit available here, and you can see the SpO2 for the 7038R. You can see the um, correlation between the SpO2 algorithmic um, data versus the measurement on finger from a commercially available SpO2 device. And obviously, they manicure this data to an extent, but in reflective mode, you can see it uh, does correlate quite nicely to what you would expect to see uh, using reduced data points um, normalized there to give you your trend. And then finally, this is the very last point of the slide, uh, Maxim, so a relatively new franchise for us in Europe. We've had them in America for years now. Um, but they have a, a wrist-worn wearable, the uh, Health Sensor Platform 3.0, which is a wrist mount reference design that essentially integrates um, an algorithm hub. As I said, they, do, they implement the discrete approach plus the front end uh, in the MAX86176 which um, just a few character points of note, this 110 dB SNR and 120 dB common mode rejection ratio are very, very good metrics. This is very high performance uh, and a sign of industry leading performance in um, ECG and PPG acquisition for wearables. Um, and then it integrates the uh, temperature sensor we discussed earlier. This is a kind of off the shelf evaluation platform to design um, wearable medical applications and um, is clinically uh, clinical grade certification as well. So that's me. Sorry, I probably went quite a bit over the time there. So uh, thank you very much for listening. And any questions you have, please feel free. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there. Thank you. That was uh, incredibly comprehensive. Fantastic. Um, we've had a number of questions coming in. And, and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll lift out a couple that um, I think would be interesting to address. Uh, so Tristan Allen asks, um, Alex, do you think accurate slash usable HRV monitoring will be a common 
consumer feature anytime soon? Um, for obviously for stress and user monitoring from the perspective of their condition and health um, or sort of the attributes that stress variation and heart rate variation have for um, mental health and a lot of the advent of um, wearables that have say haptic rhythmic feedback to allow uh, to actively calm users uh, input for in-ear monitoring where you have um, you use calming music as a feedback uh, in response to uh, HRV. Um, a lot of these developments, uh, whilst they feel a bit faddy in extent, uh, there are product families um, that are being introduced and products that are being um, introduced to the market that may do make use of HRV uh, and are actively integrating that as a metric to control other elements of the system. So we see at the moment a lot of people asking for HRV and less prevalent in the ex existing market, but I do believe that it will be um, sort of a, a key factor going forward. Any any thoughts on timescales? Like, is it 10 years away, five years away, six months away? Oh, uh, uh, no. So, well, nothing's ever six months away in this industry, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, I would say, honestly, it'd be two to three years before you start to see um, the industry sort of invest in te explaining to customers why. So it really, you need one big um, industry leader to release a platform that focuses on heart rate variation as a feature. And then they'll say, oh, and this is what it does for you. Like Dyson do it with their products. They introduce a technology that the average everyday consumer has no right to really understand or know why they need to understand it. They, it gets very simply explained in, um, in sort of an advert and then suddenly everyone wants it. And then because it's been possible for years, it's rolled out everywhere. Um, so once people start to invest in explaining why HRV is relevant and um, the focus on mental health, the focus on stress fe related features, then it will become more prevalent. But there's an investment to be done by those industries to make it desirable to consumers, because if we as engineers or as small business owners go out and try and explain it to our user base, um, it's sporadic uptake and it can be more difficult to get traction. Excellent. Um, I'll, I'll stop the sharing for a, for a moment. Um, Julian um, makes a makes a point, and I thought I'd just make that as well. Um, he's saying um, GNSS slash GPS has brought us thus far, but as we know, there are challenges uh, slash issues around the tech failing. Is there scope to consider the creation of quantum inertial navigation systems which don't rely on satellite signals as a means to innovate in this space? He then says uh, he would love to talk post event, so we're very happily facilitating an introduction between um, you and Julian. That's fine, but could you? Could you comment on the um, adoption or potential adoption of quantum tech in um, in your product suite? I, honestly speaking, outside of the computing space um, and looking at uh, sort of um, quantum computing uh, integration at a chip level for processing, I don't see, um, so far I haven't seen the prevalence due to, I think there's a limitation of, willingness and the risk of investment that it takes to integrate quantum computing into um, sort of chip level applications. But I certainly, I think you wouldn't be asking the question if you didn't already know that there is uh, an appetite, there is already a relevance through that technology to that market. Um, but GNSS has very much been a slow development to get to this point and everything around it, with the exception of the advent of say localized uh, tracking technology, such as ultra wideband from companies like Corvo, there's actually been very little in the development um, that we've seen revolutionary development of tracking technology in the outdoor or the global space. So I would imagine there absolutely is. Uh, and some of the, um, in terms of the quant yeah, quantum inertial navigation systems being a massively complex um, undertaking, I, I think absolutely there's relevance there. But have I seen it being adopted? No, not at all yet. Um, from semiconductor manufacturers. Well, I mean, there might well be things that can come out of a collaboration between you and Julian. So as I said, we'll, um, we'll make that introduction and, um, and you can take the, the conversation further. Um, just in the interest of time, because we, we aim to eat um, to finish at about a quarter past 12, which obviously we're, we're at now. Um, I kind of wanted to leave it there, but thank you very much, um, Alex. Um, and really what I wanted to do is, is obviously thank you, Alex, but thank you to all of our speakers. I think this has been a really fascinating event, um, really, really interesting, lots of insights. Um, very much looking forward to future events that we'll be doing in, in 2021. Um, and with a, with a view to that, uh, I would like to, to run a brief um, feedback poll. 
um, which obviously will, will give us your views on, on today's event. Um, but also importantly, it asks um, what you would like to see covered at, at future events. Uh, and it would be really, really useful for us for you to, uh, to complete that. It's, it's gonna take a minute, if that. Um, and it'll be really useful for us to get a, a feel of, of you know, what other areas you're interested in or, or what directions you would like us to take. So um, yeah, if you, if you could please uh, complete that, it'll be really useful for us. So, uh, so thank you for doing that. Um, while everybody's doing that in the room, um, I'd like to thank our YouTube um, viewers for watching as per usual. Um, this event actually um, sort of concludes our um, events program for 2020. So um, we'll uh, hopefully see you again in the next year. Obviously, do check out our website for any future events coming up. We're about to release um, our uh, 2021 schedule, uh, certainly for the first part of it. So um, do check out any, any events that you're interested in. Obviously, you do also look back at, at the previous events that we've done. because We've got quite a, a comprehensive library of videos on YouTube now. So, um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, like, share, and subscribe. People always say, so could you please do that? Um, I'm sure it's useful for something. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you.